Hi, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Come on in. Pop on in. I'm going to give you time to uh, get in here and invite your friends. You do not want to miss this interview. I have been so excited about the opportunity to uh, talk with our guests today. Uh, you guys have no idea. I have been to so many of his um, seminars and um, sat in on his presentations at numerous conferences. And so I'm a huge fan, Dr. Dunbar, you, you, you don't know. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Gila Kurtz. I'm one of the co-founders and co-owners of Dog is Good, which is a lifestyle brand for dog lovers. Uh, what we do is share how great life is living life with our dogs. Ideally, they're well-trained dogs, but even if they're not well-trained, they are um, your family, and we totally get that. So you can learn more about Dog is Good by going to our website. And for the highly... Uh, for those of you who are familiar with us, you know that we always do a giveaway during this uh, program, and we're going to announce the winner at um, in our private Facebook group. So I want to invite you to uh, join the Dog is Good Lifestyle group with a great community of friends, at all dog lovers all over the world. And so for this week, since we're talking about puppies and we're all dog lovers, we have the giveaway is the Dog Lover T-shirt and some necessary poop bags will go with that too so feel free to um to enter to win that and sh and share with your friends so hi Brittany. hello ann i always love seeing you guys here i really appreciate your support and um i'm excited to jump on into we, I, we have a lot of information because i have a lot of questions and i know you guys will have questions as well so answer, uh, put them in the chat. I'm going to let you know that my marketing crew is at a conference. So I'm flying solo today. They're probably laughing watching me. Um, so I will try to type in stuff as well. But uh, they usually do that in the other room. So um, anyway, we are going to get started right now. So I want to welcome Dr. Ian Dunbar, who, uh, again, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I was actually kind of nervous, like, oh, my gosh feeling a little nervous right before this interview and I thought oh, that's so crazy I'll, I'll just we'll roll with this it'll be it'll be fun but for those of you who may not know um, Dr. Dunbar I want to give you a little bit of a background he's a veterinarian and animal behaviorist and dog trainer who received his veterinary degree and special honors degree in physiology and biochemistry from the Royal Veterinary College London University plus a doctorate in animal behavior from the psychology department at UC Berkeley, where he researched the development of social hierarchies and aggression in domestic dogs. Um, he has authored numerous books and DVDs about puppy dog uh, behavior and training, including After You Get Your Puppy, How to Teach an Old Dog New Tricks. And you know, it's kind of funny. This has been in my office like forever. I don't know how, re I've had this forever, so this may not be one of your newest books, but I have quite a few more at home. So for those of you who are really interested in training, learning how to train, or um, just you know raising your own puppies, go and just research on Amazon any of his books. They're all really, really uh, great reads and very informative. Um, in 1982, though, he also designed and taught the world's first off-leash puppy class in social uh, puppy socialization and training class, serious puppy training. Subsequently, he created and developed the San Francisco's SPCA's Animal Behavior Department, the American Kennel Club's Gazette Behavior Column, which he wrote for seven years, and the Canine Games, which were first held in San Francisco in 1993 and continue as an annual event in Japan and France. He's hosted the popular UK television series Dogs with Dunbar, did that for five years, and has appeared on numerous other radio and television programs, including... The Today Show and Dash Village, which uh, airs in Japan. So, Dr. Dunbar, welcome to Dog is Good. Really, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. All right. All right. So, okay, you guys who are out there, I'm watching my, my fans pop in, and I love all of you, and I want you to share. I'm asking you to share because this is going to be some great information um, that we'll be hosting today. All right. So, you are very well known all over the world for your uh, works and efforts in revolutionizing what we do in raising puppies. And there are a lot of people out there who are very familiar with training or raising dogs, but there's quite a few people who are not. So I I'm curious to know, like at the time when you were first 
uh, realizing or, or what prompted the whole approach to revolutionize how we raise our puppies? What was going on and how, what did you bring to the table to shift our focus on puppies? You know, I guess it started very early on. I, I grew up on a farm and uh, my grandfather uh, trained all the animals. I mean, he classically conditioned them all, probably didn't even know what the word meant. But, uh, you know, one day old calves were classically conditioned to children and chickens, horses, pigs, sheep, cats and dogs. And when I got to vet college and saw them handling um, horses, I mean, it just made me sick. It was ridiculous. And, and, and still, still today, the handling of horses is, is pretty physical, manhandling, I should say, brutal. Um, dogs as well. And so moving on from there, you know, when I came to California, um, learning, because I wasn't a psychologist, I had to take like a pro sem and learn psychology. You know, I was the only non-psychologist in the psychology department. And as I was learning about uh, learning theory, um, I just realized so much of it isn't gonna work in practice. You know, this is for when a computer trains a rat or a pigeon that can't escape. So punishment's pretty effective in the laboratory because the computer's really consistent and the poor old rat can't get away, you know? But in real life, when it's an owner, not a computer, an owner who's not consistent 24 seven, doesn't have good timing, and you're training a dog who can run away from you or tell you to run away because he's fed up with it all. You know, so I, I was always thinking about this, the training of domestic animals, and then I got a puppy and I tried to get him into school and no one would take him. They said, no, you've got to wait till he's six months to a year old. I thought, this is ridiculous. And I went to look what they did and it didn't make sense to me. There was no rhyme or reason to what they were doing. It was like methodological. It wasn't based on how animals learn at all. So people would go to class and stay in class for three years. Just trying to train the dog to sit, stay, you know, and so, because I couldn't get Omaha into school, I thought, well, it was prompted by my wife at the time. She said, we're gonna do an intervention. You have to go and sit on that rock and smoke this cigar and not come back. So you can tell me how you're gonna bring money into this relationship. And I sat on the rock and thought, well, better be with, you know, about animals, dogs, um, puppies. I'd just been researching their development. I thought, I know, I'll open a puppy school. And Omaha was in the second class I ever taught in 1982. And it, it just took off like wildfire because the vets loved it because now the animals were handleable. Trainers loved it because now you could, you know, get a dog ready for a novice exam in about a couple of weeks. And it just took off like wildfire. And for 10 years, there was no one else doing it. And, you know, one by one, people would come from different countries, from Australia, um, he was a funny chap because he was an ex-military, you know, dog handler. And uh, I had him stay at my house. And he said, well, of course, you can't train puppies. You, they're just too young to get trained. So he came along to watch the class. And I really put on the show for him. And coming back, you know, we're having dinner at the house. And Mimi, my wife, said, um, so what do you think of the puppy class to him? And he says, oh, uh, uh, those puppies must have been trained beforehand. You can't train puppies. I mean, his brain just couldn't yeah, comprehend yeah. it. And so that's how I got into it. And it was just common sense, you know, and it's what we did on the farm. Every animal was trained when young. And uh, my grandfather taught me, you better do it now because tomorrow will be much harder. And he taught me um, that to touch an animal is an earned privilege, it's not a right. And if you just grab an animal and manhandle it, one day you'll meet your comeuppance. You know, you'll get gored or kicked or bitten. And, you know, I just sort of live by that common sense. Yeah, I love that. I love uh, that statement that you just stated. And that's so true, earning that right. You know, we think sometimes we can just dive in there and do whatever we need to do to, to get the behaviors that we want. And, and it's not respectful um, to, to the animal when there's so many other ways. So, um, yes, the puppy schools have popped up all over the country and much um, as a result of, of your teachings and education around that and to the benefit for so many families who then are able to raise um, healthy and behaviorally sound 
puppies who turn into healthy and behaviorally sound dogs with the ultimate goal that those dogs stay with the uh, family for the lifetime, um, for their lifetime, because probably the biggest detriment to our dogs and the disservice that we give is if we don't start training um, particularly early because behavior problems start to uh, ensue and then that can lead to um, the unfortunate giving up of a pet or um, you, you know uh, all the things we don't want to see happen. So starting off early is, is a good point. So someone decides to get a puppy. What would you say is the very first thing that they need to focus on before they even get their dog? Well, I, they need to learn how to raise and train a puppy before they get one. And they need to learn how to select a puppy. And so, you know, that's why I wrote that, that book you have before and after getting your puppy. And the house has to be prepared. Where the puppy's going to live has to be absolutely 100% dog proof. They need to know about short-term, long-term confinement so that house training, chew toy training is errorless. So the puppy enjoys time when spent, you know, at home alone, which happens because most people have to work. So they do just a little bit of research and they need to know what they're getting because, you know, the general public has been led to believe that every breeder is great and every purebred dog is good. And shelters lead us to believe every dog is the perfect friend for you. But, you know, they're very different. And for example, with breeders, um, my dog Zuzu at the moment is beginning to ail. And I, I think it's because she's getting old after checking everything out. And it's disgusting. She's not even eight yet. You know, little, little Hugo died when he was five. These are purebred dogs. And so the first thing the owner needs to know is how long will this dog live to have some idea of what I call the litter longevity index, which is the average of the age at death of the litter's great, great, great grandparents. And from that, and they should all be dead, but breeders are breeding much too early, especially male dogs. They're breeding them at 18 months and two years old. So they haven't proven themselves yet. So I have a simple rule, you know, when I talk to breeders, they say no dog should be bred, no male dog before he's 10 years old. So at least you know then 50% of the genetic stock of the litter comes from long lived dogs. So know what you're going to get, know how it's raised in the breeding kennel or how it's trained at the shelter because a lot of breeders and shelters do nothing. Whereas other breeders and shelters do lots. And so you're going to get an eight week old puppy that's already house trained, chew toy trained, manners trained and really well socialized to people, safe socialization. And then you've got to realize, look, the clock is running. What you do in the next month, will make or break this puppy for life. Because right. if you neglect things like early socialization with people, then the dog will gradually start to become fearful. You see, it looks okay. Puppies look confident and friendly because that's they're in the approach stage of development. But starting about four and a half, five months to eight months, now they're going to become progressively wary of things they're not familiar with, like strangers, children, men, you know, as well as loud noises and weird environments. So you, you want to expose puppies, you know, to 100 people in the kennel, 100 people during the first month at home, and quite safe, no risk to parvo or, or, you know, you bring the people to the house. Just make sure they take off their outdoor shoes so they don't track in parvo poop or distemper urine or, you know, and, and with the, the flus going around, I would ask people to wear clean clothes too because you, it can be transmitted on clothing. But socialization, socialization, otherwise the pup will start to become shy, standoffish, wary, then fearful, anxious around people. Yeah, and so you bring, that's horrible. It is horrible. And you bring up a really good point. I was gonna, um, uh, def, okay, so we're focused on uh, socialization right now. I wanna, we'll ultimately go back to some other points that I wanna highlight, but um, it is, I, I know it is so critical uh, to do this. And I find that some of the clients that I work with, when you say the word socialization, the immediate thought in their mind is that it, it means to get their dog around other dogs. For the viewers, could you just really highlight just the, the key things that define socialization as we know it in terms of helping that puppy uh, be able to 
properly. Yeah, the two most important things to teach any puppy are bite inhibition. So if he reacts, if he bites, he doesn't do any harm. So the problem is dealable, very easily dealable. Um, next is socializing puppies with people. For a lot of people, socializing them with other dogs comes way down the list at about number six or seven. You know, and it can wait because the puppies just spent eight weeks with mum and litter mates playing all day long. Just four weeks, that's all you need of living in a doggy vacuum. Then you go to puppy class and they're going to, it'll bump start it all in the very first class. But you can't wait on the socialization with people. Um, it's just too important. And especially if you have breeds that the media, you know, makes a flack about, you know, pits and rotties and Akitas, Malamutes, you know, it's like they, they say boo to someone and they say, oh, kill a dog. And so, and it's like, you know, our dogs, you know, we had an American Bulldog, I used to have Malamutes, uh, now I've got a Bosa on, great big black and tan dog. They have to be perfect. Can you imagine if one of my dogs barked at a child? My whole career would just, get, you know, go down the toilet. I'd lose my street cred. And they say, oh, yeah, well, Dr. Dunbar's dogs bite children. So they have to be absolutely, you know, perfect. And But the most important reason to do it is for the dog. There is nothing worse in life, I think, than being, having no confidence and being anxious and then having to meet your biggest nightmare, your biggest fear every day, people. Right. That is so well said, and I think that that's the perfect way to think about it. Um, just to highlight a couple of points that you mentioned, the critical period, you know, by the time they're four and a half to five months, uh, they're developing potential problem behaviors that they, we don't see when they're when they're younger. That those fears, those um, you know, standoffishness, or some. I know some folks now currently who are dealing with this perfect dog who suddenly is reactive at about five and six months of age. <laughs> yeah. So it's good to educate um, the public that. You know, these are really critical things that have to happen the moment your dog comes in the door and that it is a, a revolves around the socialization of people which you can bring in your home but a question that i have for you that i hear all the time is if you want to properly and safely socialize your dog um are there any ways to do that without having to keep them behind the four walls of your home um well, I, I, I don't see any need, you know, when we look at the time course, I think they should be socialized at the breeder's kennel. People come there. One month in the house, socialized there. And if they have two shots after eight weeks of age, two weeks apart, then one week later, they should have pretty good immunity. And so they can now go to safe places like uh, puppy class or visiting friends, you know, granny's house and what have you. I maybe wouldn't take them to riskier areas like um, a park in a low-income neighborhood, so low income, low vaccination rate, probably high virus load. I would still carry them into the vet, probably the most dangerous place to take a puppy when you aren't sure about his immunity, especially the car parking lot. So leave the pup in the car and the, you know, the vet tech can come and get him and plonk him straight on the exam table. But then, you know, that's only a sort of a little unknown period between 12 weeks and, say, for a month. And then you should be able to take them anywhere. And if not, well, they're never going to have immunity. Um, but I, I like to have fun in training. And so I say, have a party, for goodness sake, once a week, you know, 20, 30 people. Everybody is going to handle the puppy, handle all the hot spots, all the subliminal bite triggers that you know, are the reasons why dogs bite when they get older, like, you know, the collar, the number one reason. Not, it's not a stranger, it's a member of the family that drabs a dog by the collar. Then we got the ears, ear cleaning, and the muzzle, four paws, the ghoulies, the rear end, hugging it, eye contact, valued objects, children, men, strangers, and then other stuff that's weird and scary. So they get all that thrown at them when they're really, really young. And you can't do it too young. I mean, neonatally, if you, you know, puppies can't see or hear yet, but they can smell, so they know that's a child or a man or a stranger, someone I don't know, and they can feel. And you can desensitize nine of the 14 most common subliminal bite triggers. 
So by three weeks, you've got a pretty solid dog, you know? So I don't think there is any need to, you know, get the dog out there in the community yet. But starting four months, I would say a walk a day, you, you cannot beat it for a socialization exercise. Stop every 25 yards, have the dog sit, stop every 100 yards and sit down and let the dog hide and eat and see the world go by. And every time there's a change in the environment, you say, well, look, there's a man on a motorcycle. Treat, 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 treat. Hand feed the dog his kibble. Don't use training treats and don't use a food bowl for his dinner. Hand feed it when there are changes in the environment. And then by about five months, you have a dog like Zuzu. The other day, there were people on the street. She's so excited. Can I say hello? And I said, can she say hello? And uh, there's an elderly couple. They said, yeah. I said, her closing speed is going to be enormous. Don't be scared. She'll sit before impact. And off she goes to greet these people and sits and they pet her. And, and now it's a joy for the dog to see people and children because children, they know we're going to get 10 treats when we see a child, you know? So it's just that people, they don't realize, I think, what socialization is, is with people. Um, and it's people handling the dog and training the dog. See, that in itself is a very important temperament test. If someone says to the dog, come here, sit, lie down, take a treat. All of those four things are a temperament test. Dog's off leash, does he approach you? That's the best sign, the dog likes you. That's how I did all my research on individual social and sexual preferences. We would tether, say, a male dog or six male dogs and see which one the female would approach. And then you know which one she likes best, you know? And then to sit, well, if it sits, it's saying not only will I come, I'm willing to stay around for a while and lie down. And the dog is doing it um, happily, willingly, and he's being compliant. He's proving he's compliant. He's not trying to dominate you and dominate the world, this stupid myth that makes life awful for most dogs out there. You've got to hit your dog. You've got to be boss. You've got to show him all this rubbish. I mean, it just makes me, and I just want to vomit, but I don't take the bait. I just say, you know, I bet I could train your dog quicker off leash and I'll do it with any dog I don't know. I mean, it's what I'm doing these days, doing it and filming it. And then does the dog take the treat? I tell vets and groomers this, you offer a treat, three things could happen. The dog says, thank you, takes it, we'll give him 20 more. Now he really loves you and loves your vet clinic. What if he doesn't take it though? Give the treat to the owner, does he take it from the owner? No. The dog's probably scared of the environment. What though, if the dog won't take a treat from you, but he takes it from the owner? He's scared of you. So don't touch that dog. Your examination can wait. You know, for a puppy's first visit, a physical exam only takes five minutes. Let's get real. So if the pup is in there for 20, then don't touch him. Remember what my grandpa said. It's an earned privilege. So feed that dog 100 treats in 15 minutes. So obviously, we can't use commercial treats. We have to use regular kibble. So I use a kibble that's easily broken into eight pieces, Zwee Peak. Um, and so by giving, what, 13 pieces of kibble, I've given over 100 treats. And the dog says, I love this plate, man. Place, you know, at Gran and Gramps Veterinary Clinic and Treat Dispensary. And, and the dog will remember that for life. There's nothing like first and last impressions. Absolutely. You know, to that, I have, um, so I still train um, dogs, mostly puppies, actually, but very part-time because I, you know, I'm very busy running dog is good. Um, and what I find fascinating is the resistance sometimes that people have that they're, you know, oh, but why have to, you know, feed it? But yet, when I come over and work with the pup um, and I engage in that process right out of the gate, the pup knows me only in one context. Right. So every time I come over, they immediately want to work with me. They immediately they, they know they have a, a contact. Of, this is the lady that, you know, I always get uh, my kibble from or, or whatever. So I think that's a really good point. And I know that. Um, and then the training goes so much faster. And if, if, the, if we can help our clients understand um, doing that versus feeling like they have to withhold that the dog should just do it because. Um, you know, they, they need to understand what the whole learning process is for the pup. Well, the word, word there, should, is the wrong word. 
No, it's lovely when the dog does it because I'm, I'm babysitting Kelly's dog at the moment. She's at a conference in Mexico and the dog, I mean, he's, he's lovely. He just wants to do everything just to do it with you. He's engaging me nonstop all day long. When I'm reading the paper, he says, will you pay fetch? Will you pay fetch? Will you hide the chew toy, please? Will you throw it at least? Will you do it? You know, so it's lovely if the dog is like that. But the point is, most dogs don't have a trainer as good as Kelly. And most owners aren't very good trainers. And so saying, I don't want to use treats in training is saying, and I guess with your child, you're going to say you want to educate the child without books. That's the equivalent of educating a dog without food or these days to educate the child without the internet. It's crazy. So there's two things about treats. People are not giving anywhere near enough. They should be giving thousands during the puppy's first three to four months in life, mainly classical conditioning treats. So the dog likes the environment and loves people, but then they have to phase them out. What's happened, a terrible thing has happened with using food in training, but the old way with Sirius was you use food as a lure and as a reward. In the first session, the first session, you phase it out as a lure, so it's no longer in your hand, and then you phase it out as a reward because they're much better rewards than food. We just use it as a starter treat. But when you look at dog training classes all around the world now, everybody's wearing a bait bag. It's ridiculous. And whatever the dog does, they give a treat. So you've got a load of spoiled dogs that do it when you've got a bait bag. But if you don't, they probably won't. Well, that's not a trained dog. So people don't use enough early on and they don't phase it out in obedience quick enough. So you never, never, ever phase it out for classical conditioning. Um, we have a thing in our house when a dog dies, the day after he's buried, we go down in the morning and we each lay a treat on his, his gravestone. And that's symbolic of, you did a good job. This is the last classical conditioning treat. But I, you know, and, and you have to classically condition them to like people in puppyhood but also when they're geriatrics and getting a little grumpy. Now they don't want to be pushed around and prodded by kids. So we up the classical conditioning in their golden years as well. Um, but for obedience, no, use the food, phase it out. And use tug as a reward, fetch as a reward. Go sniff is my favorite. I love it. I, I use them in the you know dog park. I sit my dog probably every 30 seconds. Zuzu, sit, say hello. And what that means is go and sniff that dog's asshole. <laughs> what a great reward. And so it'll never become a distraction for me because my dog's always allowed to do it, but only after it sits and looks at me. You know, always use what becomes a distraction or what you call a problem as a reward in training, whether it's barking, chewing, running, running away from you was Dune's favorite. He would love it if I would chase him. So I'd say, Dune, come here, sit. And he'd stay and look at me and I'd tap him on the head and say, tag. And he had to run away from me. If I could catch him, if I could tap him on the butt with my hand, the game was over. I say, gotcha. And I'd walk in board. Well, he loved that game. So he was uncatchable. So now I'd have to call him again, come and sit, stay and then tag again. That, that's awesome. I love that. Okay, so a couple of things, and I see people are already asking some questions, so I'm going to be looking over here at the chat, and I'll be throwing some questions your way. Um, one of the questions has to do with uh, the nipping, so I thought this would be a good time to dive into that bite inhibition, the importance of starting that, when we should start that with our puppies, and how do you do it? Um, so there's a, one of the questions is a gal here, Karen, has um, a 12-week-old pup. And yes, I'm sorry. A 12 week old pup. I think it's, um, sorry, Karen, I'm looking back for the question. I think it is an Aussie. Um, nips and bites a little bit and wants to know what's the best way to introduce her pup to children. And I think a lot of puppy owners have this challenge. You've got those needle sharp teeth. Um, you're working on trying to work on the bite inhibition and, and the socialization all at the same time. So can you um, share with us, first off, what you define as bite inhibition? This is I say it's such an important topic, and I'm never going to be able to get through it in a short um, interview. And so the book you showed at the beginning 
before and after you get your dog is the hardback edition. If they go to any of my websites, seriouspup.com or dogstardaily.com, that's a free multimedia website, you can download the book for free. Because, you know, that book is so good. I, I thought, you know, I just want to give it away for free. It's not like we need money, you know, we have a very successful business. And so that's really important because the, the information about bite inhibition, you want to read it. It has to be precise. So I'll list a few points. Number one, it's the most important thing you'll ever teach any dog, any animal, to be careful around humans with its weapons. Um, number two, we're not teaching the puppy never to bite. This is the worst information a puppy owner could get. Don't let the puppy bite you, he's trying to dominate you. No, the puppy biting behavior is the most important thing they do. That's why they're biting machines. So these needle sharp teeth hurt because they don't have powerful jaws. They have weak little jaws. That's why the teeth are needle sharp. Soon though, within three months, the jaws will be powerful enough to cut through metal. You know, so what we're teaching the dog is, no, you can mouth, but you do it more gently. So four stages, I'll just summarize them. Number one, um, no pain. If the puppy hurts you, oh, no mouthing of anything apart from your hands. No mouthing your face, no mouthing clothing. It's, it's, it's not sentient and it's too close to your body. So you don't know if the puppy is hurting. So hands only, very sensitive. If the puppy hurts, you say, ow, worm, that hurt me. I had to say that to um, Lass last night. He was just getting a little active and, uh, you know, he just bumped in. I went, ow, that hurt, worm. That's it. That's all. You don't have to shout. You don't have to grab the puppy. You certainly don't have to flip him on his back and any of this, you know, silliness, you know, obviously from people who don't have trustworthy dogs. That's why they think they have to do it. Number two. Now, no pressure. You pretend it hurts. And when we're doing these exercises, we're teaching them off. Okay, you can mouth me. Off. So it's learning the word off, which we've also taught with toys. Off, take it, thank you. With tennis balls and tug toys. Off, take it, thank you. With food. Off, take it. When we say off, it knows don't touch with your jaws. Then, once it's now, it's only mouthing you, it's gentle. We will teach the puppy that you must stop when I say so. We practice mouth, off, mouth, off, mouth. You stop it and start it again, the play session. And eventually it can never initiate mouthing. Really important, you know, with children. But at three months, I mean, a 12-week Aussie, I just bring kids around. Kids that live with dogs so they know about the mouthing behavior. Kids are natural teachers of bite inhibition because their feedback is perfect. You know, they play with the puppy and they jazz them up too much and that puppy just bites them a little too hard and the child goes, <laughs> and the dog goes, whoa. Yeah. And it's exactly the puppy's response when you watch, you know, I spent, watched for 10 years litters of puppies growing up and all they do when they're awake is bite each other. Why? So they're developing bite inhibition. So then if they have a fight when they're both three years old, there's no damage done. It's just the equivalent of a human argument, you know? And um, it's the very basic, absolutely, crucially important, you know, principle of all animal behavior, that all animals learn to inhibit the force of their weapons when they're growing up as youngsters. But I say they want to read the material to make sure they understand it because a lot of people who don't say, don't let the puppy mouth you. He's trying to dominate you. Well, that is a very dangerous dog. If you never let this three-month-old puppy mouth your hands a lot, he won't have bite inhibition. So we socialize him so he likes people. But what if a child slams his tail in the car door and the dog reacts? But if he's got bite inhibition, he won't hurt the child. I have so many cases from, you know, I used to have a bike clinic way back in the 70s and 80s of dogs that were in excruciating pain. Uh, my, my favorite was a lady who was going out on a blind date and as she was leaving the house, this is the 70s, so no mobile phones, the phone rang. So she ran back to answer the phone and she trod on her Rottweiler's thigh wearing stiletto heels and it punctured in and out 
in one side of the thigh, out the other. The dog bit her on the ankle. She said, I didn't even feel pain. I just felt wet. That's what bite inhibition is. Even when with excruciating pain, intentional provocation or accident, the dog reacts. Yes, of course it does. Anyone would. You hit your thumb with a hammer. Yow! Or as I hit my dad's thumb with the hammer once when he was teaching me carpentry. But he didn't smack me. He said a few words I'd never heard before. And I knew this was not cool and I shouldn't have done that. You know, it was an accident, by the way. So it's such an important topic. So they must read it. And if they go to Dogstar Daily, there's videos about it. There's more. There's a free training textbook there as well as downloading. And that information is in after you get your puppy. That I originally published the two books as before you get your puppy and after you get your puppy. And then when New World uh, condensed it into the hardback, um, they put them together. So I would uh, definitely read it to make sure they're absolutely clear on the rules. I, I agree. And you guys, I put the link in because there is such a wealth of information on there. Um, and it's so easy for anybody to understand. You do not need to be a trainer to do this. And you have to do this. So uh, please go to the website and at least download it and read it. It's so gracious to, to give it for free, which is, which is awesome. Um, okay, so a couple other things that are also really important. Um, I know everybody wants to make sure that they have a properly house trained puppy. So um, what do you suggest or as you're, when you're working with, with people, how do you help them? What is your advice on ensuring that those pups are house trained and what kind of commitment do those owners need to make? Well, I mean, the way I do it, I mean, there's many ways to house train. All I'll say is the way I do it takes about three days, um, either with a four week old puppy or with a 10 year old dog you've just adopted. Mm -hmm. And the key to it is you have to be able to predict when the dog needs to go so that you can ask him, do you need to go? Let's go potty. And then we run him on leash to the toilet area. And then we say, go pee or go poop. That are the terms I use. And we know he's going to go because that's the key to it, predicting when. And we do that by using the crate that when we're at home, he's in the crate all the time. Every hour on the hour, we take him out. We know he needs to go. Any puppy is going to urinate within three to four seconds once you've got him in his toilet area. So you can be there to show him where and then you reward him with a number of treats sequentially. So I go, sniff it, eat it, sniff it, eat it. I'll give six or 10 treats in a row, depending on how quickly they go or how long they urinate. Um, when you're not there, then you've got to confine the dog to a long-term confinement area that has a comfy bed in it and a toilet down the other end. There must be a temporary toilet because at eight weeks, a puppy's bladder capacity is about 90 minutes. And, you know, you're going to be at work for eight hours. So, again, this is all in, you know, the, the books that they get for free. And additionally, housing a new puppy this way or an adult dog, um, they will learn to enjoy settling down on their own, to love going to the crate, because every time you put them in, you give them a new Kong stuffed with food. So, you see, they aren't getting fed out of food bowls. Why waste food lures and rewards? They either get it hand-fed, teaching obedience or classical conditioning, um, or it's moistened, stuffed into Kongs and frozen. And now, when you put them in the crate, within seconds, they're lying down quietly. And so every bit of food that comes out the Kong rewards the dog for lying down quietly, not barking, not running around like an idiot. And reassures the dog, isn't it cool to be in your own little, you know, private doggy den on your own? And so now when you go to work, say after the week you took off to get your puppy used to being at home, the puppy's cool with it. He likes, he has the confidence to be, uh, you know, have little quiet moments at home alone and he won't freak out because again, we come to this anxiety thing. It isn't right to have a dog that's anxious off people or of being left alone and then do nothing about it. It's the only time in dog training where I get really angry, although I, I don't show it. I say, I want you for a moment 
to think how your dog feels. Have you ever been anxious? Have you ever had an anxiety, a panic attack? Yeah. Well, your dog has it all day long, every day, because you won't do anything about it. I told you what to do, and you won't do it. You're still feeding him out of his food bowl. And because of that, I can't come back to see your dog again. I, I cannot look at dogs that are anxious when the owners do nothing. And so I'm sorry you're no longer a client of mine because it gets me so upset when I see dogs which are fearful and anxious. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I think that's a great stance for any trainers who are watching to take that position. Um, it is your duty to that amp, to the dog that you're serving um, is to try to get some compliance with these owners and, and to post it in that, in that, um, in that language and having that conversation, because when you pose it like that, it does shift how people think about it. Um, it really does. And I have a, I don't, you know, train many clients now. It's usually for free. I, I work with a charity that trains assistance dogs for veterans with PTSD. Um, but so I don't take money for training, but I don't take a client unless they sign my compliance contract. And it says that, you know, I basically say, look, you know, there's loads of things I could do, like um, go skiing, do some construction, gardening, do anything with my son, play with my dog that I'd actually rather do than talk to you about your dog unless you're interested in what I have to say and you promise me you're going to do it because I will ask your dog every week I come back and if he doesn't do it because behavior doesn't lie, I know if you've done the homework, I'm going to say, right, that's it. And if it comes to that, here comes the, the real kicker and trainers can learn from this when I realize they aren't doing the work because I've seen it so many times now, and I know if the dog's behavior isn't changing, it's not because he's a difficult dog. It's because they haven't done what you've said. I, I've been duped by that so many times. And so before I say goodbye to the owner, I say, well, let me say goodbye to your dog. And I kneel down in front of the dog, and I take his little head in my hands, and I say, it's okay, buddy. You'll be okay, all right? Yeah, I'm sorry. And the, the owners say, well, what's wrong, Dr. Dunbar? And I say, do you want to know what's wrong? I'll tell you, you're what's wrong. I said, I've told you what to do, and you just won't do it. And I cannot stand seeing your dog suffering like this. So I can't come back. Unless you call me within the next 24 hours and say you're going to listen and do it, I don't want to see your dog like this. Oh. And it's a little, you know, play acting, but wow. It gets yeah, I mean, that is so powerful. I can't imagine yeah. anybody that then turning it over. And I, I cry real tears too. It's, well, I do. I, I, when I say it, I get myself up. They aren't crocodile tears. And then tears come out. And so they see this is pretty real. And, you know, I'm getting up so now talking about my breakdown. I can't continue the interview. The, the potential reality of it is if they don't listen to you. Yeah. And you a year later with a dog that's unmanageable, many of those dogs then go to the shelters and often because of their behavior become, as you said yourself before, unadoptable uh, or more uh, uh, not as easily adopted out. And, you know, there's a risk that they end up losing their life all because the person who wanted to have this precious um, animal in their lives didn't take the time or the responsibility to do exactly what they needed to do to ensure that they raised this dog properly. Yes, and there I would also include breeders, breeding puppies, and shelters housing dogs to adopt them out, that it's irresponsible for them not to listen what Kelly has said for years about shelters, what I've said about puppies. You know, I think we blame owners much too much. And I think for a lot of owners, when I see what they start with, I was just helping out a lady in San Diego who wanted a golden retriever. So she got it at 12 weeks. Oh my word. What had the breeder done with it? Nothing. Nothing. They just wanted to hold on to it longer to look at it for a show prospect. Was it pretty looking? So she gets a totally untrained, unsocialized dog at 12 weeks. This dog is afraid of the wind. Then she convinced them to take a second puppy with it. It was sending this lady insane. So we took it in for three days and they were sleepless. They were literally sleepless. I stayed up on the couch because my friend goes to bed early and gets up early. So we did a 24-hour watch because this dog could not be on its own. It screamed. It screamed. 
But by the fourth day, now it slept on its own in the crate all night long. But it's still scared of weird things like um, uh, weird substrates on the floor, the wind. Um, the other day I opened the basement door, but it was dark in there. It was spooky and the dog bulked and ran. It's so cruel to do that to a dog. So I think breeders have to listen to and shelters have to listen that any shelter, if someone goes there, they should see more people than dogs and more dogs outside of their kennels than in. That it's more like a cross between a country club and a university, as Kelly always says. The dogs are being worked all day long and handled by 50 to 100 people every day. So now they have a really good idea, you know, how trustworthy that dog is when they adopt it out. You know, not a one-time temperament test. I mean, let's get real. It tells you nothing. All it tells you is how the dog acted on that day in this place with that person. Well, how about tomorrow with the person who's adopting it at home? They may get a big surprise, especially if a woman temperament tested it and it's a man who's the owner, you know? And so, yeah, I, I mean, I have really tried to, I think, look at the problems that are out there, but I, I really understand like shelters when they say we don't have time or money. No, my programs don't need time and money. Owners, when they say, I don't have time, I want it quick and easy. My training techniques are the quickest, easiest, most effective techniques that you can use because I'm always testing how many seconds or how many minutes did it take me to put a one minute sit stay on the dog? How easy is it? So I don't even show them a clicker until they've been with me for a couple of months. I mean, that's probably the hardest training, reward based training technique to start with. It requires a high skill set you know, immaculate timing and a PhD in psychology. And owners don't want that. They want lure reward training. And if that doesn't work, then all and non reward training. And bam, that crazy dog with no recall learns a recall in one session in the dog park. And so I, I, I really like care for owners. I get it. You know, you probably had a few laughs. I know everyone in my office is today. I'm doing this on my own. Your tech crews on, <laughs> on my crew <laughs> they said do you want us there dad i said no i think i can manage it we practiced yesterday so jamie said well my mobile's on i can get over there very quickly because i i i have no patience for it i can't do it it always goes wrong i just want it to work right. and that's what owners are like with their dog they just want it to work quickly and that's why ease you know, quick and easy is important, effectiveness. And then I say, well, m why not make it enjoyable too? So I play oodles of games with the dog. But when the dogs can play these games, they are really well trained. You know, if a dog could play musical chairs, oh, wow. He's walking around, people, you know, uh, off leash with 12 other dogs off leash. And when the music stops, the owner sits him behind a line and runs and sits on the chair. And he has to stay there while the person without a dog tries to get the dogs to break. That is a trained dog. Off yeah. lead, healing, lightning fast sit, rock solid, bomb proof stay. And yeah, so, was, and everyone's yeah. laughing and the dogs are wagging their tails, you know? That is fun. That sounds like an awesome, fun class. And speaking of classes, I, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about puppy classes. I mean, yours were the first in the country and um, you offer a great program. There's a couple of things I think people should know, though. What should they be looking for in a puppy class in their area? And how, how old should the puppy be before starting? And just kind of, if you could touch on that, too, to help people as they're navigating their local yeah, there's area. There's three types of puppy class, I guess. Yeah. One is a puppy kindergarten, eight to 12 weeks. That's the puppy. It's mainly handling with people. The puppies sit in people's laps. Um, if there are no disease threats in the community, we let some puppies go nose to nose if all the owners are, you know, cool with it. Um, because we notice a massive difference in puppies that are meeting puppies in a safe place. So puppy class is a pretty safe place when, you know, you look at Parvo or Distemper and stuff. Um, the main, though, starter puppy class is uh, 12 to 18 weeks, no exceptions. So 12 weeks to um, 17 weeks and six days, no exceptions, because the 18 weeks they change into adolescence so quickly. Um, and it's off-leash, very important. 
So owners want to go and watch the classes beforehand. Are the puppies off leash? Because if they aren't, the, uh, the trainer can't see the problems. You see, in a group of 12 puppies, usually when I talk to my trainers afterwards, I always film myself when I you know, teach puppy classes now. And I say, okay, which of the 12 puppies are going to bite people before they're five months old? Because I've already picked four. Did you see the puppy who wouldn't take a treat from me? And the one that was hiding under the chair when the child ran by? This is all predictable that suddenly they're going to change when they're eight months old. There's no sudden about this. You can see it in puppies when they're eight weeks old and 12 weeks old. So the main thing is that the class is off leash, that there's loads of classical conditioning treats given out. So everyone there, the 24 people with the 12 puppies, hand feeds every puppy a couple of treats, but the treats are phased out in the first session when teaching obedience. So you may not be able to get rid of them entirely, but after luring the puppy, sit down, sit, stand down. Now we say, right, put the food in your pocket, try with an empty hand. You know, or give the food to someone else. So now it's a distraction. And when you say, good dog, that person will feed the dog for you. So now you're getting used to working with food, not in your hand and not on your person. So we're phasing it out as a food lure and a reward. That's really important to accelerate it. Otherwise, it becomes a bribe. And I find it very sad because I was the person who brought back using food in training. It used to be used in the 1700s, 1800s. And then starting 1901, 1903, with Conrad Most's book, they said, no, we don't use food, and we're going to train the dog on leash, and when he gets it wrong, we're going to jerk him. And that trained training for a good 60, 70 years until I brought back off-leash lure-reward training using food, lures, and rewards. And everyone says, oh, I don't want to bribe my dog. I said, no, it's not a bribe. It's a lure and a reward. A bribe is something very different. A lure is, you see, to show a willing dog what to do. You say, siéntate. Well, the dog doesn't speak Spanish, so he doesn't know that you want him to sit. But if you say, siéntate, and the food goes up in front of his nose, his nose goes up, his butt goes down, then you say, good dog, and give him the food as a reward. A bribe is to get an unwilling dog to do it. There's a massive difference there. You know, so a lure is educational, so the dog learns the meaning of the words we use, human words for doggy behaviors and actions. But what's happened to dog training in the last probably 10, 15 years, it's become a bribe, and everyone's going, treat, 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 and the dog's doing nothing. He sits, he gets a treat. You know, he comes, he gets a treat. How about come, sit down, and stay for 45 seconds? And then so him. Go play. No need to give them a treat because play has become a distraction for all these people, you know? But not for me. I don't need treats because play is the reward. Tug is the reward. The tennis ball is the reward. On the couch is the reward. Tummy rub is the reward. And um, But we need food for novice owners to start the dog off. And but then we have to phase it out. The number one off-leash lots of classical conditioning food but that's the number one reason you're going to puppy class is so your puppy can meet loads of people and then way down the list is so you can train your puppy off leash you know it's pointless going to a puppy class where all the puppies are on leash and the owners are sitting down listening to the trainer waffling on about learning theory it's bizarre it's ridiculous you know we, we do a lot of testing so, like, I love testing the first week of puppy class. They right, line your puppies up on the count of three, tell them sit. And when they're all sitting, I always say, t say stay. And number one, it takes about two minutes to get them all sitting at the same time. Then I say stay, and I hit a stopwatch. By two seconds, they've all broken. Well, by the end of class, the stay is now up to, say, 12 seconds. That's 600% improvement. Next week, it'll be 30 seconds or a minute. So I'm always timing. So I can say to the owner, did you see that improvement in one class? Mm. And this isn't going on. The quantification has disappeared. You know, there's always like your pros and cons, good news and bad news. And, and the old obedience classes for adult dogs on leash, you know, 
teaching obedience drills, like, yeah, 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 yeah. But the good news was they quantified the response. Everyone was training to go into novice and test their dogs. A one minute sit stay, three minute down stay. Trainers aren't doing that now. And so essentially a lot of owners are getting cheated, I think. That's a good point. Okay, I want to, um, I could talk to you all afternoon. But <laughs> well, I'm not busy, I'm just doing construction. Our, fact, our uh, folks here, a chance um, to ask any questions. If you guys have any questions, we'll pose those. I will tell you, um, we probably have about 10 more minutes. And so if you have any questions, pop those on in. I mean, this is a wealth of information. You, you definitely have a, a huge fan base around the country, too. And I have so, a question for you before we start. Right when we started, was, did you throw your dog at Kong? Oh, it was her ball. Her ball. That's good. Uh, right before I started, because I'm also babysitting another dog, I gave the two dogs four Kongs between them. That's Stuff awesome. With food. <laughs> yep. Bolo, our yellow lab here, um, she's you know, she's been exercised and done all her things and she just likes to hang out. But it, inevitably, the moment I start talking to somebody on this show or if somebody comes to my office, that's when she wants all my attention. She wants to play, but she's now on my, um, I would turn my computer feed if I could, but she's sleeping quietly. Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> I, I did a <laughs> webinar last week and I'm not kidding. It was a countdown, three, two, one. Ding dong, ding dong. <laughs> like this <laughs> and it was UPS so I actually had to run outside leaving a blank screen yeah. and so uh, she talked herself you know well I talk about classically conditioning you know in, in my business we ship a lot of products to retailers all over the country and to people as well and so the UPS folks come by twice a day and our dog will hear the truck when it yeah. first corner and as soon as she hears that truck, she zips downstairs. She knows those guys are going to be giving her a little biscuit. Um, she likes to stand in, their, in the doorway of their, of their truck and get that. So, All right. Does anybody have any questions? Are you guys all good? I'm going to tell you, you got to go get Dr. Dunbar's book. We, we, put in the, um, we put it in the comments. I'll add more later. Um, I just want to remind you, we are, you know, give, our giveaway this week is the are the poop bags and a dog lover t-shirt and i want to invite those of you who have not um, been part of our community if you're first time um, seeing us here because of dr dunbar join our dog is good lifestyle group it's a private group on facebook we do a lot of fun things in there and have a lot of great information to share as well and um you can learn more about our company at dogisgood.com so with that, Dr. Dunbar, I want to thank you again so much for your time. This has been such a treat for me. I am such a huge fan. And um, actually, I think it's pretty cool because I remember when I first went to my very first APPT conference many, many, many years ago. So, gosh, well, it was a long, long time ago. I need to say. <laughs> yeah. And um, I remember, guys, it was at that conference where – I was thinking about how cool it would be to create a line of products that celebrated how I felt in the relationship that I had with my dog and what I was seeing um, happening with people in their relationships with their dog. And here we are today. Dog is good, is born, and I get to, to speak to my one of my heroes. So thank you for all you do, and thank you guys for joining in and for sharing this, and we'll share this as well in our um, throughout the day and, and make sure that it's nice. Thank you for inviting me and um, love to come back anytime. I think I've mastered the technology side of it now. I can do it on my own. So, Well, we will. We'll bring you back again for some other subject matter, maybe on problem behaviors and how to address yeah. that. But uh, anyway, thank you again. Enjoy your Wednesday. And for all of you out there, thank you. We'll look forward to seeing you next week here on the Dog is Good Lifestyle Show. Take care and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.